Hey guys, my name is Sham Kumar, and I live in a place called Frederick, Maryland, and this is the Frederick Podcast. Okay, we're sitting here with Mark Etheridge over here at the PB Dye Golf Club's uh, Bar and Grill. And I have the honor of speaking to one of the uh, resident experts on bug life here in Frederick County, as well as uh, bug life photography. Mark, thanks for agreeing to come on the show. It's a real honor to have you here. Well, thanks for asking me on. It's a great show. Uh, thank you. And I know you're a supporter of the show, which makes me even happier to hear. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself. You watch the show. So give us a little background. Who you are, where you're from, how'd you end up in this lovely place called Frederick? Okay. Uh, well, I grew up in North Texas, uh, in suburbia, in the 60s and 70s, always looking under rocks, looking for bugs. Um, went to school to study archaeology, wound up at SMU, uh, went out to Arizona for a brief period of time, became an archaeologist, card carrying and the whole bit. <laughs> then I met a girl and I wound up in Frederick. Wow. You know, I, I love the, the many different stories people have of how they ended up here, but that's mm -hmm. one of my favorite ones for mm -hmm. love. I, I absolutely yeah. love that. Yeah, we went to Northern Virginia first, okay. and then we started coming up here. We did a little genealogy, and her family was from up here. Oh, so okay. we spent a lot of time going up to the Myersville area, and finally we saw a for sale sign, and there we are. Wow, that's that's really cool story. Uh, I, I like that a lot. I have to tell you the story of how my wife and I met someday. It's yeah. equally cute. I hope yeah, yeah. I hope you think so. I'll we'll interview see. you someday. Yeah, you interview me someday, and okay. I'll tell you my story. Sure. Um, so tell us, uh, what's your day job, uh, Mark? I work for Montgomery County government. Oh, fantastic! Um, and it's as boring as that sounds. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not boring at all, actually. Uh, well, you said you used to do archaeology. What made you transition out of that into government work right now? Through archaeology, I learned to use a transit. Oh, okay. And when I moved back to Texas from Arizona, mm -hmm. I needed a job really bad. Sure. I wound up on a survey crew. Oh, wow. And worked for a uh, civil engineering firm mm -hmm. that brought me in to do some drafting. Mm -hmm. uh, the owner of the firm actually collected butterflies. Oh, wow. So they kind of took a shine to me, gave me some extra, you know, incentives there at the office. I was about there for about five years. And... Uh, Put out some feelers up here when I wanted to move out here and yeah. uh, got a job at a, uh, an architectural firm working as a civil engineer. Wow, um, that's pretty cool. Um, so how did you get into bugs? Um, you know, you're a big bug photographer, and that's one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the show because yeah. ran into you at our favorite watering hole, uh, Barley yeah. and Hops, many mm -hmm. times, and I've seen you with your laptop, and you had the coolest pictures. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I realized you were taking them. And that's how I understood that you're interested in bugs and your exceptional photography related to that. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, like I said, I've always looked for bugs when I was a kid. I've always been attracted to that. And I've always been attracted, I guess, as part of my archaeology uh, experience as well, in classifying things and yeah. ordering things sure. and, and keeping records. And so uh, when I got out of archaeology and got back into real life and tried to find something I could do for fun, uh, insects was right there. Yeah. Uh, with the advent of digital photography, it has helped a tremendous amount, and the internet as well. So many resources there for doing identifications and things. Citizen science opportunities are out there. Yep. People can spend their time, I think, in worthwhile ways, mm -hmm. helping people accumulate records and information yeah. for use. No, 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 absolutely. So, so you, that, that's how you got into bugs. Now, you mentioned the digital age. So you picked up a camera when and started photographing and cataloging these bugs, if you will. Well, back in the dark ages when we used something called film. Oh, God. Yeah, when you were shooting blind, had yeah. no idea what you were going to get. <laughs> I wasted a lot of money on film and slides. Yeah. And I uh, got one or two good slides out of a batch, yeah. you know. Uh, did that whole thing for a while. And mm -hmm. then I was able to finally move into digital mm -hmm. and uh, we can take a lot more pictures. Now, the other thing was... Back in the old days of film, I had to collect a lot of material, too. Sure. So I spent a lot of time processing all of that, which I still do some. Mm -hmm. But with, with the, the, the digital now, you can get such great definition on the photographs. You can actually get good identifications for a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, and, you know, with the digital age, you know, we have some really powerful sensors in these cameras now. That The fine detail, the zoom that you can get into that level that you can't even get through with, like, you know, some magnifying glass, if you yeah. will, you know? Or I had one night I was taking photos, and I spent about an hour and a half, and I think I had 150 shots, and I realized I had my settings wrong. Yeah, <laughs> that's happened to all of us. I realized it because I started looking at the photos, yeah. which I could not have done in yeah. the analog days, and I, so I had to reshoot a bunch of stuff. And right. I was able to do that and kind right. of save the trip. You know, it's funny you mentioned the film days. A lot, of, a lot of people don't realize that today's generation, and that's okay. It's not their fault, but what's interesting is that you know, I picked up the camera when I was probably like 10 or 15, 10 or 11, 
And I remember after a while, my mom was just like, you know, it's great that you have this hobby and all that, but, you know, monetarily, it's uh, not in our budget for you to, you know, putting that pressure on everything. Yeah. So she, I kind of put that down and kind of picked it up in the digital era myself. So yeah. it's kind of it's kind of neat to hear about that. Um, so tell us a little bit about your excursion. So where do you go and shoot pictures of bugs? And I really concentrate in Maryland and mm -hmm. more specifically the Frederick area. Mm -hmm. I've been living here in Myersville for... 23 years. Wow. And I've been just accumulating information about Myersville insects mostly. Mm -hmm. When I was collecting a lot, I was doing a lot of collecting just within the town limits. Mm -hmm. Put together a lot of uh, insect drawers of mostly moths, but beetles and other things too. Sure, you had lots of yeah. and bees. And I took those to the grade school a few times yeah. to show the kids yeah. what's out there. And it was interesting because I went in there one day and a, like a fourth grade class came yeah. in. And the teacher brings the kids in and says, look at this, kids. These are from all over the world. Yeah. And I was able to say, no, no. That's... These are from right here outside your back door. Wow. All of this stuff is right here. And people just don't see it. Yeah. And that's kind of one of the things I like to do is, is, is that, that level of, uh, of analysis and collecting. You know, I think that's the part of the awe of the bug world is that people don't understand there's a whole sub-environment right beneath us and around us and above us, and we don't even realize it. I find something new every time I go out. That's what, that's what I mean. Every single time. You know, I, I've lived all over the world, and there's different flora fauna that I've come across, and, you know, bug life is just one of those aspects. Yeah. But it's just amazing how different things I see every day. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, I, you know, I did a little research, you know, before talking to you because I wanted to be a little educated on, on, on about bugs and stuff like that. And it's just amazing how much is just here in Maryland, like you just said. And just forget Maryland, just Frederick County for that yeah, matter. It's right. just, you know, so many things out there. Um, There's about 2,500 species of moths in Maryland. <laughs> you believe that? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Just the diversity of, of the creatures in just one insect. I've identified over 850 myself. In my like, like you have individually seen over... Yeah, eight. I've got records of 850 or more that I've done, mostly in the Frederick County area. Wow. That's, uh, I, yeah, can't that's that. yeah. I can't even fathom that. Yeah. Can't even fathom that. Um, tell us a little bit about which time of day do you go out and do this? Like, is there certain insects certain times of day, I imagine? Oh, sure. You know, yeah. moths are nocturnal mostly. Okay. So that they're, you've got to go out at night to find the moths. Yeah. And it makes it difficult to have a day job and a night hobby. Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sleep very much. But one of the things I do a lot of, there's a few places around Myersville. One place just outside of town where we get our, uh, our springs are located for the town. I have access to that. So I go out and I'll set up some lights. You know, moths are attracted to certain types of light. A lot of moths are. Mm -hmm. Ultraviolet lights is one of the mm. main things. So I've got some ultraviolet battery-powered lights. Oh, wow. They're within a mesh, that, uh, like a mesh cylinder. So anything that comes to the light lands on the cylinder. Oh, wow. I set those up just about, you know, the time it starts to get dark. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, uh, They'll just hang attract out all night long and, yeah. and monitor that and take photographs all night long. Wow. So, like, what do they land up on that you take photographs? Like, do they land on a tree bark? Like, I know you have your lights and they're attracting them to the light. And you said that just the cylinder, you're able to focus on the cylinder from your camera? The cylinder is made of a, a nylon mesh. Oh, I see. So, they land on that. They can sit on it. It's moths, bees, wasps, flies. Wow. Beetles like crazy. <laughs> All kinds of stuff comes up to the lights. Yeah. Uh, I do find them in other ways, too. Uh, some moths are not attracted to lights. They're attracted to bait, let's say, for example, sure. like rotted fruit. Yeah, that makes so sense. So I usually put some bait on some trees nearby. I'll go check those out occasionally during the night as well and see what's, <laughs> what's crawled out to eat. Well, what's the latest you've stayed up to do one of your excursions? Oh, till sunrise. Really? Yeah, you stayed up all night sometimes? It's common. I usually stay out till sunrise, yeah. Oh, wow, and then you go to your job. <laughs> no, then I, no, I don't do it on a weekday. Okay, good. Uh, Smart man, yeah. I, maybe on a Friday night, yeah. you know, big Friday night for me, big party guy, I'll go out and watch moths all night, and then the, as, as the sun comes up the next morning, I'll pack it all up, go to a diner and have some breakfast and get some coffee and look at the photos. Like, oh, wow. No, that, that sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I like what you said about you know you bringing your stuff for the fourth graders you know i'm mm -hmm. big fan of motivating the younger generation from a science perspective any any science right yeah. i'm you know because i was like just like any kid i had my bug face growing up you know and yeah. then i have you know other aspects of life I, uh, that i'm big fan of now like light and photography i'm a big you know photog on my own side okay we'll have to compare pictures sometime absolutely um, yeah. i don't take pictures of bugs or anything but tell me like what is the most impressive thing that um the kids find when you present your bug work to them like what are the most things that makes them go oh my god wow <laughs> one of the funniest things was that when you have a, an insect collection you have to worry about these beetles that will actually eat your collection 
Oh, they, really? There's yeah. a, there's a, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. There are what a beetles that have? Your, that, it's a huge thing with museum specimens. Really? They're always, they're always on the watch for these things. So you have to keep some insecticide in the dead bug boxes. Huh. You do that with little, little shell pest strips and yeah. you cut those into little pieces uh -huh. and they're bright yellow. Mm -hmm. So a little girl came up one day and she was looking at the box and she goes, why do you have cheese in there for that? <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> yeah. Another kid walked up, this fourth grader, it was amazing. I had some beetles in there and I didn't even know what they were. Yeah. He started telling me the Latin names of these beetles. Really? This fourth grade kid. Oh my God. Said, Dude, can I get your card? Because yeah. I need to talk to you. Yeah, you're going to be the next big guy. What is it, yeah. entomologist? Sometimes it's as amazing for me as it is for them because you, yeah. the reactions you get are just incredible and unexpected. Yeah, that's really cool. And just like kids, you know, just going back to focusing just on the bug world again, it's just amazing the number of cool things that you find and like people think you know the being an entomologist or something is boring work but when i was at disney world for example just stepping away from from frederick for one second hope people forgive me when i was in um, disney world i one of my friends works there and i take my family there as often as i can and uh you know i asked him that we're actually in a swamp land disney world's built yeah. on the florida swamps yeah. and they literally converted that into you know that jungle yeah. uh, concrete jungle paradise that that disney world is but I asked the guy, how do you manage to keep all the mosquitoes away from here? And he said, well, they have an entire slew of entomologists working for them they where they do. peacefully and properly, without disrupting the ecosystem, plant certain bugs in certain places so they can keep okay. all that stuff away, mm -hmm. uh, all the mosquitoes away and things like that. And they place you yeah. know, the correct wildlife in certain places. So I thought that was kind of cool. That's neat. That's neat. Um, switching back to uh, uh, Frederick now, mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us, in all your years that you've done this here, um, do you start to see patterns of certain uh, bug behavior, if you will, or insect behavior? I know that's kind of hard to do because you probably have to study them for like 100 years before you can kind of figure that yeah, out. That's the thing about patterns of that yeah. type of nature because insects are, don't have static uh, areas where they exist. Mm -hmm. They expand their ranges, they mm -hmm. retract their ranges right. all the time. Oh, really? So, yeah, you, you'll see range extensions or you'll see uh, uh, strays yeah. that, that show up in the area that aren't normally from here. Interesting. And they may make it and, and, and propagate and whatever, for whatever reason, climate right. change or whatever it is, continue to exist here or they may mm -hmm. just back off. There's a, a moth that comes up from South America and makes it up here every October in the fall. They fly all the way up here? It's called a giant witch. It's about that big. What? And there's always <laughs> a few sightings all the way up here, but they don't reproduce here. I see. They just stray up here every year. So, I mean, so they just kind of find their way here? Yeah, they just <laughs> take off, and uh, <laughs> they're, they're found every year, yeah. Wow. Not a lot of them, just a couple of sightings. I still think that's amazing that they make it all the way up here. It's crazy. I can't even imagine what that trip begins to look yeah, like for and that. That's just one species, and then there's, yeah. there's lots of things that, that do similar, similar range extensions. Um, so, what kind of equipment do you use? Because I'm sure there's some camera buffs out there right now going, man, that guy is cool, and I want to do exactly what he's doing. Well, I don't know about that, but I, <laughs> it's challenging because I'm yeah. taking pictures in the dark of night yeah looking directly into an ultraviolet light right at close proximity right so what i use is i use a nikon d810 okay it's got a, a large sensor so i can crop down what's the what do they call those full frame sensors it's a full frame full frame sensor yeah uh, I, I wanted it because the megapixels are large enough to give me enough real estate that i can crop down to get more detail out of the photo sure. it's taking a macro photo is difficult because you lose the closer you get, you lose a lot of your depth of field. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to get a really good, clear picture, you have to close down your aperture. Right. But you're also losing a lot of light when you get really close. Correct. So to, to compensate for that, I've got two flash units that mount on the end of my lens. I use a 105 micro lens. Right. Nikon. They, they mount on the end. They're slave units. So when the camera flash pops, it sets off these two So it's flashes. wirelessly it flashes. So yeah. I can provide extra light for a smaller aperture. Mm -hmm. I usually take three or four shots of everything as well but yeah, the smart. focus is just totally critical and everything's handheld yeah because i can't set up a tripod no it's moving you don't know where they are yeah, yeah. so and, and then it, it i've been i've been able to to uh to make it work pretty well i think do you feel like they are aware the insects of your interest in them it's funny than the you know, sometimes you think the, the the flash would would scare them mm -hmm. and sometimes it does mm -hmm. but for the vast amount of time it's like they have no idea they're probably used to the natural lighting and they're probably adapted to that. 
There's a few because the camera will, will give a, a, a very brief pre-flash, mm -hmm. and they'll jump right at the pre-flash. Right. It's hard to get those yeah. pictures because... Because they're scared, and then they're, you're, you lost yeah. your shot. Right. It yeah. doesn't happen very often. Usually, yeah. it's, it's not too hard to get a good shot once you mm -hmm. get everything set up and you're going. Okay, so uh, Mark... Um, tell us a little bit about the biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity when it comes to insects because I know in the animal world um, we worry about the extension of, extinction of certain species mm -hmm. um, and the reason we worry about that is because it ultimately can affect our food chain and our food supplies and things like that and our ability to eat and grow crops and everything has an ancillary effect. What about in the bug insect world? Um, does the because um, it's a, it's a little bit more microscopic than the big animals, but does that have a, an impact on, you know, the broader picture of us, right? How can it affect our food chain? Can it affect our lives in any way? Well, I think if we're worried about changes in the environment that may affect us, we often look at things that are more sensitive to those changes mm -hmm. so that we can predict them coming down the line before they affect us. Right. The canary in the coal mine kind of thing. Sure. You take the canary down there because it's going to be affected by the bad gases that right. might show up before the humans actually notice it. Right. So it's that kind of a thing. So we have this system, this, this, this natural system that is so complex. You can't just talk about insects mm -hmm. really because insects and animals and plants and, and, and the, the, the climate, everything interacts. We can't possibly understand every bit of it. No, but it's hard, yeah. The more information we can gather, mm -hmm. the more we can analyze that and try to look for patterns that may sure. become important to us. Right. Uh, no, that's, that's important. And uh, that's kind of how climate change is kind of, um, that's how we kind of found mm -hmm. out about it. Uh, but uh, going back to biodiversity, is there any... Uh, Who's doing this work right now? I mean, is there anybody talking, doing the work that you're kind of talking about? Well, there is an outfit called the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Oh, great. That actually started up in 2012. Okay. And its, its goal is really to accumulate information about all life in the state of Maryland. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it goes from protozoa to people. Really? Yeah. Wow. And, and it's, it's citizen science. It's also accumulating information from published accounts and museum collections. Uh, they're partnered with the... Uh, uh, the Maryland Plant Atlas mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Everybody can be a participant. If mm -hmm. you'd like to go out and take photographs, mm -hmm. this is one thing that gives me a reason to go out and do something is to, to do that because I know I'm going to share that information Absolutely. through and the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Right. Uh, which you just take the pictures yourself and look at them at home, it's kind of boring. It's cool, but boring. But You're part of now I'm else. part of something larger. Yeah. So I've been editing for them for the last three or four years, cool. working on other people's photos to get those into the system. Yeah. And I've, I've edited almost 20,000 records so far. Wow, 20,000 records. That's, that's quite, that's a large number of photographs. Yeah. yeah. So what other questions are they trying to answer? You like, so basically, are they looking for patterns and what do they ultimately hope? Is it like, sort of like the climate change thing? Those scientists went to Antarctica and studied the ice for 30 years and they said, yes, we had an impact. And now they're saying, because of the changes we made, it's getting better. There was a group in Germany that did moth collecting with traps. They would trap and kill these moths. Okay. And they did this for 30 or 40 years. I don't know the number. I yeah. can't remember. And they would weigh them. They had this long series of, of collection and weight data that is just shown very clearly a reduction in total number of insect species over the years. Wow. For whatever reason, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But it's clearly shown that, that that's a real reduction in species numbers. Wow. They talk here about the, the windshield effect. I don't know if when you were, you know, people that grew up around here when they were kids, yeah. your dad always had to go get the bug stuff to take the bugs off the car. That's right. You don't see that too much anymore. You don't. You don't see those bug splats on the windshield as yeah. much. And the argument is that maybe there aren't that many bugs that there used to be. Or they migrated somewhere else. And so are, away we, from the are we seeing a reduction generally mm -hmm. in diversity in, in the area? Right. And I just hope that <laughs> the reduction in that diversity doesn't affect the you know, humans and other animals. That's and, the decision we have to make, but we yeah. can't make it without the information. So collecting the information is very important. really fun for me. I love it anyway, yeah. but that also gives it a good purpose. No, that's great. You know, I think that's, that's an awesome cause to be a part of, and I'm glad you're part of that. So, Mark, tell me, you know, I bet you, like you said, you came across this moth from South America. Like you said, they come up all the way up to, up to you know, people have cited it here in Maryland. Mm -hmm. What would you do if you ran across in your photo adventure, something that you've never seen before. I know you're not an entomologist, but you've seen quite a few number of bugs in your life. What if you come across something and you go, you know what, I've never seen this before. How do you go about saying, how am I going to identify this? And 
you know. That happens to me every, almost every time I go out. Oh, that's I cool. Find something I've never seen before. Right. So then what do you do? Yeah. You know, back in the old days, you might have to travel to some museums and look at some museum collections. Sure. You might find a couple of guidebooks that might have some photographs. There's some great guidebooks out there right now. One just came out for the Moths of the Southeastern United States, just got really? published. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. But with the internet, there's a lot more resource out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Iowa State University's entomology department has a really good program called bugguide.net. Mm -hmm. Anybody can upload a photograph. They have experts. They have ant experts. They have bee experts. Whatever you happen to have, wow. they will, in most cases, be able to give you some information. And mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, actually identify it to species. Wow. They'll collect that data as well, map it on the map. You can oh, look cool. at the range extensions and things like that. Makes it a lot easier to do things iNaturalist is another one mm -hmm. where we have, it's a crowdsourced, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of experts that are part of that crowd. Sure. And people will, will, will give comments on what they think it is that you just found. Sure. So when three or four or five people say it's the same thing and you've yeah. got some experts in there, you got some good identification. Wow, that's, that's amazing. There's a whole community out there that can absolutely help you. And you have these, all these cool resources. It's just like any other science field, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of DNA work being done now, trying to refine the Linnaean classification system because it was okay. all visual. Mm -hmm. Well, we're finding a lot of information through DNA about the, the uh, relationship between mm -hmm. different species. Uh, so that's really interesting too, and that's moving forward leaps and bounds, especially with the internet. A lot of museums are digitizing their collections, their physical collections, oh, wow. and publishing those and allowing citizen scientists to go and transcribe the collection data for them so they could be published making all that data instantly available to everyone around the world. Wow, that's just so much that you can learn from. And all this, this internet era has really put us in a good position. And, yeah. And the entomology field has obviously benefited from that as well. Absolutely. Um, one of the sadder things I heard about entomology, you know, I, I'm a scientist, so I like all kinds of science. I'm not into bugs as much as you mm -hmm. are, but one of the sadder things I've heard about uh, the Fukushima nuclear incident that happened in Japan is that the moths, I believe, they were finding that the radiation effect that the first generation moths were exposed to, mm -hmm. they were passing some of those genetic defects down the line. Oh, wow. That's really sad because that could affect their existence, if you sure. will, and, yeah. you know, and you know, they may not make it. And I, like you said, yeah. I hope we find, you know, we find out whether or not they affect the ecosystem in a larger sense, because that's an important question. Mm -hmm. Are they affecting the weather? Are they affecting whatever food chain? So, mm -hmm. sure. um, you know, one of the things I learned about fish when I lived in Buffalo was that, you know, uh, one of my friends is a big fish guy, and he was talking about Asian carp coming in and kind of infesting the waters and disrupting the local mm -hmm. ecosystem. Yeah. I imagine in bug world there might be similar things. I heard about bees a couple of years ago, uh, you know, crazy killer bees from the, you know, from the yeah. south mm -hmm. coming up all the way up to Texas and disrupting the local eco ecosystem, affecting yeah. honey production and things like that. Are there anything like that up here that you can think of? That, There's you know, a lot of them. Yeah. You mentioned bees. There's a giant resin bee that came from Asia that's mm -hmm. causing disruption locally with local bee populations. How do they make it all the way from Asia? Did somebody bring it in? Or? It's usually shipped in. Shipped in. Yeah, they yeah, just some other shipment. Yeah. Uh, the stink bugs we had a few years ago, they were mm -hmm. just prolific. Right. I remember and those. They kind of died back a little bit now, thank goodness. That's right. But those showed up. I think the first collection was in Reading, Pennsylvania in 1998. Wow. And they came over from Asia, mm -hmm. and they just proliferated here. I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. There's another one that's poised to come into Maryland this year. Mm -hmm. It was it's been in Berks County, Pennsylvania for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think it was it was transported in on some building materials from Asia in 2006. Mm -hmm. It's called the spotted lantern fly. Wow. Bad news about that for me and you is it one of the crops that attacks is hops. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, hops and grapes. It can it can ruin a grape harvest, so, so they can't even take the harvest to to, to market. Wow, that's terrible. These are actual true bugs. Yeah. They're hemipterans, so they're going to be puncturing it and sucking the juice out. Oh, and wow. they also produce this honeydew that's really goopy and gets on all over people's houses. And, and uh, Wow. Yeah, it's going to be interesting if they show up here. And there's, I think there was one found in Delaware mm -hmm. and a dead one found somewhere not too far from there. But they're looking, we're really looking for those this year to see if they show up here. It's, it's got to be hard because, you know, you know, they're not part of the local sea ecosystem, which is why they're an invasive species, they if you will. They have no predators right now. They have no predators. So, yeah. And then if you go about trying to get rid of them, you might destroy some of the local you ecosystem. You be careful. You can't take the nuclear option. You know, and just you kill know. them all, because yeah. then you can kill all the good stuff, too. Yeah, gypsy moths. You know, we used to have the gypsy moth spraying. Mm -hmm. And the argument was they were spraying at a certain time of year where it really didn't affect other moths and butterflies. Well, yeah. No. 
Of course it does. Yeah, exactly. Uh, luckily, we haven't had to do all that yeah. lately. Yeah. But that was another invasive that came in, I think, in 1868. It was mm -hmm. brought over here commercially mm -hmm. to try to produce silk. It didn't work, so they let them go. <laughs> <laughs> and who knew back then that, you know, it has yeah. such these effects? We have invasive mm -hmm. species that are brought in here on purpose mm -hmm. to fight other invasive species mm -hmm. that turn out to have behaviors we didn't predict. Mm -hmm. Same thing with plants. They brought, they brought plants in for the same reason. Oh, yeah. Like no, absolutely. And, and the ships, too. You know, the ships, when they circulate water for cooling, they bring in some invasive species and they yeah. stick to the inside of the engines. Tiger mussels and all that Yeah, stuff. somehow they survive and <laughs> bring it to America. Absolutely. You know, Zika is one of those things, right, that are... Yeah. You know, bug related, sort of, Absolutely. right? Mosquitoes. Of course it is. And, you know, they, you know, when they were do, doing this experiment down in Brazil about, they were creating these mosquitoes, both male and female, that when they go to procreate, they send things to each other that kind of negates their ability to procreate. Oh, okay. So they kind of cancel each other's ability to procreate. And I, first thing I was worried about is, my, you know, we're just mass killing these mosquitoes without worrying about what happens to the ecosystem. But it turns out, Mosquitoes don't have that effect that what I thought they did, and they're like, "Well, frogs eat them, but like, frogs eat everything," you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so that was a good thing, you know. So apparently, they at least I hope that fact still remains true. Twenty yeah. years from now, we'll find out. I'm always icky when we we just draw those conclusions so easily, you know. We oversimplify as humans. I think we just have to oversimplify. Because of disease, we yeah. are doing something, and I hope. You know, Zika. I, I'm a big fan of obviously eradicating this problem, but sure. you know, I'm a big fan of treating the people without figuring out, you know, in 30 years, yeah. we shouldn't have killed all those mosquitoes. So I hope I'm wrong. So, yeah. hey, listen, Mark, this has been great. This well, has yeah. been super interesting, a totally different angle than anything that we've done on the show so far. Well, so I hope it was fun. Uh, I, I think it is, and I'm sure my audience will agree. And uh, thanks again for your time. And, okay, sure. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to, uh, if there's an invasive species, we'll have to do a redo of the show and do a report card next year to see what yeah. kind of species are coming in here and okay. stuff like that. All right. Absolutely. Thanks again. Yep. That's it for this week's episode of the Frederick Podcast. If you like what you heard or watched, please subscribe to me on your favorite podcast app for automatic updates. And also please search for me on YouTube under the Frederick Podcast and subscribe to me there as well. Until next time, I'm Sham Kumar. Thank you for listening and watching.